Linda Laura Burfield was born in Carver, Minnesota in 1867. Once she had made the decision to become a doctor, she moved to Minneapolis and she left behind her husband and two children. In 1902, she opened her first clinic and it's where she began to claim that she could cure patients through fasting. In 1904, she married Sam Hazard, but he was already married, so he was sent to prison for two years for bigamy. She was now Dr. Linda Hazard, and she believed and taught that fasting could cure pretty much everything from cancer, tuberculosis, a toothache, a headache, leg paralysis, or even something that she called derangement of the nervous system. Once her husband was released from prison in 1906, they purchased 40 acres in Olala, Washington. A few years later, her 100-bed sanitarium was built and she named the property, which consisted of her house and five tiny cabins, Wilderness Heights. In 1908, she wrote a book called Fasting for the Cure of Disease, and in it she talked about how fasting removed the toxins that caused imbalances in the body. She believed that all negative health symptoms were caused by the stomach and its inability to digest. If the food wasn't being digested, then the person should fast until their stomach is able to digest properly. Her book sold around 40,000 copies, and she had patients of all ages from all around the world. One of those patients was eight months old. A dentist and his wife starved their baby under the orders of Dr. Hazard. The baby had to be placed in a children's home. But the thing is, Dr. Linda Hazard wasn't a doctor at all and it's believed that she was responsible for the torture and deaths of 20 to 40 people in the early 1900s. She didn't have a medical degree. She did have some training as an osteopathic nurse, and she was able to practice medicine in Washington State and licensed as a fasting specialist. She was able to receive this license because of a loophole that grandfathered in some practitioners of alternative medicine that didn't have medical degrees. Even though she didn't have a medical degree, she would snap at anyone that called her Mrs. Hazard instead of doctor. She claimed it was good to let the digestive system rest through fasting that would last for multiple days or weeks at a time, so her patients were only allowed to consume very small amounts of vegetable broth, fruit juices, or oranges. They were also often made to walk miles a day. If they were too weak to walk, she made them crawl. They were bathed in scalding hot water. They received daily enemas that sometimes lasted for hours and massages that nurses said sounded more like beatings. Patients would cry out in pain while she pummeled their foreheads and their backs. Her sanitarium eventually earned the nickname Starvation Heights by the locals because they would sometimes come across her emaciated patients in the woods begging for food or for help. They were walking skeletons on death's door. Sometimes children would see the starving people in the woods, but they were reluctant to help because they were afraid of Dr. Hazard. She was very domineering and she seemed to have a power over people. It was almost as if she'd hypnotized them. Some believe that she used black magic or mind control over her victims. A reporter even warned people to avoid looking into her eyes because she might bewitch them. Because patients were going into her sanitarium and not leaving alive, people started to notice. When a patient would pass away, she would sign the death certificate, but she never listed the cause of death as starvation. She'd blame it on an undisclosed or undiagnosed disease. But the cause of death was usually listed as starvation when outside doctors would sign them. It's hard for people to understand why she wasn't stopped sooner, but because she didn't have a medical license, it was difficult to hold her accountable. Not being an actual doctor worked to her advantage. Another reason was because her patients willingly submitted to her treatments. They trusted her because she was well-spoken, appeared to be educated, and had money. If only they knew she made her money by taking advantage of her patients financially once they were in a delirious state and were unable to recognize they were signing a will. It's believed her sanitarium was built with money from her dead patients. Linda Hazard's downfall began in February of 1911 when wealthy British heiresses Claire and Dora Williamson saw an ad for her book in a newspaper while they were in British Columbia. They were in their 30s and in decent health, but they believed the doctor's treatments could help them. 
Dorothea, also called Dora, had swollen glands and rheumatoid arthritis, and Claire had been told that she had a dropped uterus. To them, after reading the ad, Wilderness Heights sounded like a beautiful, quaint, and relaxing health facility for upper-class women. They pictured horses grazing the fields and vegetable broth made with produce from nearby farms. But once they arrived in February, they were told the sanitarium wasn't quite ready, so the good doctor set them up in an apartment. The fresh and delicious homemade vegetable broth they imagined was just a mixture of canned tomatoes and water. For about $100 a month, they received a daily massage, potato or vegetable broth, fruit juice or asparagus juice. Sometimes they were given six asparagus spears. She also made them drink about eight quarts of warm water every day. Within two weeks, the sisters were so weak and emaciated that a nurse had to go to their apartment to care for them. Linda Hazard told Dora that she wasn't allowed to eat yet because her tongue wasn't clean and that her breath had to smell sweet. By April, they were so weak and tiny that they had to be transferred by ambulance to the sanitarium. They were now fainting during their daily enemas in the bathtub, so a canvas sling had to be installed across the tub to catch them when they fell. The sisters didn't tell their family where they were because their family didn't approve of them following all of the latest alternative medicine fads, so no one knew where they were. Greg Olson, the author of Starvation Heights, which is a book about this case, wrote that the sisters' faces were so gaunt that when they smiled, they resembled leering skulls. At this point, they could only take a few steps, so they had to be carried. One of the sisters sent a mysterious telegram to their childhood nurse, Margaret Conway, that only contained a few words. Come, SS Marama, May 8th, first class, Claire. The telegram was so nonsensical that the nurse purchased a boat ticket to check on the sisters. This is what set the wheels in motion. Linda Hazard's dirty deeds were about to be known. She had been keeping the sisters separated because Claire had started to question their treatment, but unfortunately by then she was too weak to walk or leave. Plus, Linda Hazard had managed to get Claire's signature. She was now the beneficiary of a large share of the sisters' wealth. They were worth $400,000 or $13 million in today's money. Linda had even forged Claire's final diary entry that was made on the day of her death, making it seem like Claire wanted to give Linda her diamonds. Oh, and she also specified that she was to have exclusive rights to the care and disposal of their bodies upon their death. She even sold Claire's teeth. When Margaret arrived on the SS Merrimah, Sam, Linda's husband, met her as she was getting off of the ship. When she asked how Dora and Claire were, he said, Miss Claire is dead and Miss Dora is helplessly insane. I am sorry. He told her that Claire's death was caused by some type of medicine that she was given when she was a child. He claimed that those medicines caused her internal organs to shrink and had given her cirrhosis of the liver. The only thing Margaret could do was weep. When Margaret met Linda Hazard, she noticed that she was wearing Claire's silk gown and her hat. When she saw Claire's body on the embalming table, she said that it looked like someone else. The hands, the shape of the face, and the color of the hair weren't right. There was talk that Claire's body had been switched with someone else's to hide how badly she looked after being in the care of Linda Hazard, but that has never been proven. When Margaret finally saw Dora, she was only about 50 pounds. Her bones were protruding so badly that she could not sit down without having pain. But even though she was literally starving to death and her sister was now dead, she refused to leave. It took the intervention of an uncle in Oregon and about $1,000 that was paid to Linda Hazard before Dora was free to leave. And Dora had also signed over her power of attorney to Sam Hazard. Now, this is what Dora said about the so-called doctor. I think it was psychology entirely that was responsible for the continuance of the treatment of my sister and myself under Dr. Hazard. The woman knew from the first that I did not like her. But by some process of coercion, she won me over so that I didn't protest anything that she wanted to do. 
it seemed to me that she acted afraid of me most of the time too. I don't know why. She would glare at me sometimes with those terrible eyes of hers. She said that I was an imbecile and that she feared that I would harm myself. She would often suggest the possibility of my taking my life. Once she had a patient that had tried to force her own teeth down her throat and she was afraid that I might try the same thing. During the time we were fasting, I wanted food, oh so much, but she kept on saying, just wait a little bit. Finally, I got into such a condition that I didn't care for food and really believed that I didn't need any. The woman is as strong, if not stronger, than most men. She cut down and carried with ease large logs of green timber that would tax the strength of good-sized men. Linda Hazard was finally arrested in August of 1911. On February the 4th in 1912, she was sentenced to the state penitentiary at Walla Walla for two to 20 years of hard labor. She was released on parole after only serving two years. Her attorney submitted an application for the governor to pardon her sentence and she received a full pardon in 1916. Once she was released, she moved to Auckland, New Zealand, where she opened up another facility and probably killed even more people. Because she used the title doctor, she was charged under the Medical Practitioners Act for practicing medicine without a license. She was found guilty and fined. She eventually moved back to Seattle, but fewer patients signed up than she expected. Her reputation just wasn't the same. The sanitarium burned down in 1935. She had 100 beds, but less than a dozen patients. In 1938, she fell ill, so she fasted for several days until she died. 